Greetings from Department of Hepatology, PGI Chandigarh. I would like to thank the organizers to give me this opportunity and allow me to present remotely as I could not be there in person. I will be talking about endoscopic ultrasound in the management of viruses. Endoscopic ultrasound has evolved greatly in the last four decades from this very uh, difficult to use cumbersome diagnostic tool to a more ergonomic diagnostic tool to this very, very versatile tool which can be used for multiple procedures. Now, this is a real game changer. Having a linear array echo uh, endoscope with a mounted coaxial channel which allows a needle to come out within the plane of the insonation so we can see exactly what we are poking into so we can target lesions we can avoid vessels or if required we can intervene into vessels directly so this makes eus a great tool for vascular intervention and we use it to block flow in vessels we can even use it to re-establish flow in a blocked vessel we can use it to interrogate a vessel and you know measure pressures uh, we can use it to create a new channel as well well most of this work is actually blocking flow in a vessel and we can use it to block gastric viruses ectopic viruses and if required esophageal viruses or shunts we can use it to block pseudoandrosms we may use it for thrombolysis however that is extremely experimental we can use it to measure pressures as uh, it, it would have been talked about earlier today we can use it for portal venous sampling and infusions these are vessels that cannot be easily targeted from percutaneous approach and uh, we have animal data that it, it can even be used for tips. However, it is quite far away from human use as of now. So let us talk about gastric viruses. Gastric viruses can be seen in about a fifth of patients with cirrhosis and are associated with high rates of complications. More importantly, they can bleed at lower portal pressures. So these become candidates for, uh, when, when they bleed, they become candidates for emergency care. And even when they are not bleeding, they may require intervention. Why do we need EUS? Well, in India, we have a lot of expertise with endoscopic uh, management of viruses. So why do we need EUS? Well, when these viruses are not bleeding, the only way of assessing them is by probing, which is rather archaic and does not give us a lot of information. And when they are bleeding, they can sometimes lead to this large pool of blood in the fundus and make things very difficult to assess. Well, this is what EUS gives us. It gives us an exact estimate of where the varix is, First of all, whether it is there or not, where exactly it is, how how badly is it flowing, can we tackle it? If we do tackle it, have we done a good enough job? All of that can be uh, assessed right there on table in real time. Also, very interestingly, we don't have to puncture the free wall of the varix in many cases. We can actually go from the security of the cruise of the diaphragm. We can go through there and inject coils or whichever agent we choose to to obliterate the varix thus given us that additional layer of security so we can use cyanoacrylate glue to block the viruses uh, potentially we can use gel foam we can even inject thrombin or just pack the whole varix with coils and that alone will take care of all of the flow in the varix cyanoacrylate glue is the most commonly used ingredient and it is what most people use uh, in day-to-day -day practice so this is a video of how this procedure is done. This is a large varix, approximately four centimeters, three and a half to four centimeters. It has this distal loop and a proximal loop. We can inject uh, a needle from here. This scope is currently in the esophagus. We can see the hypoechoic crust of diaphragm over here. We can cross it and inject coils. This is the first coil being injected. Here we are injecting the first coil. Then we can withdraw the needle and place the second coil in this loop and we can already see thrombuses forming over here and then we can inject glue and lead to complete obliteration of the varix so coils form a scaffold but coils are expensive each coil costs 10,000 rupees and we may need three to five of them even up to seven or eight if the varix is large and this can prolong the procedure because each coil has to go through this large needle and very occasionally uh, they may get stuck in the needle causing a scare. In addition, as a transplant hepatologist, I also uh, encounter this problem often when, especially with the lesser curvature of varics where a coil has been placed, 
that the hilum assessment becomes difficult because of the starburst artifact of this metallic coils. So if there is a way to minimize or eliminate coils, that would make me happy. So can we do that? Well, it requires a going back to the drawing board and understanding how the varus is formed. Uh, in cirrhosis, we have high resistance and high flow in the portal vein. As a result, the portal venous pressure increases. So to, in order to decompress this pressure, the body tries to form collaterals with the systemic venous circulation. The portal venous circ circulation is at 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury. The systemic side is more like at 0 to 5 millimeters. So these collaterals actually decompress the system. But in the bargain, uh, they can form viruses, which can be esophageal viruses or gastric viruses. Gastric viruses are usually fed by the short gastric, posterior gastric, or left gastric vein, and they drain into splenorenal shunt or occasionally into azygous venous territory. Now, this is important to know how the inflow feeders work. So, when we are using uh, the EUS to occlude the varix, we are covering a large real estate. The viruses in the fundus are large. So, we can inject multiple coils and inject glue and obliterate that. But if we change the point of injection to the feeder vessel, this can be done much more easily with much less um, uh, substances to, to block it. So this is what we target and this is how we have been able to bring the uh, amount of glue and coil used to a minimum. So this, this is an example. This is a 40 millimeter varix, a reasonably large one. And here we will trace it back. This is the varix, and I would like to bring your attention to, to this loop. You can see this loop going all the way along. This is the spleen. We, we can see this loop going over here. And we'll be able to trace this loop all the way back to the splenic vein. So this is the head of pancreas, neck of pancreas, and this is the splenic vein. So we could see this loop going all the way and joining the splenic vein. So in all likelihood, this was a left gastric feeder. We can target this feeder, inject a coil over here, and a single coil can take care of this feeder. And here we inject 2 ml of undiluted cyanoacrylate glue. This leads to formation of this glue cast within the, within the coil, and this has reduced the the flow into the, var uh, the feeder tremendously. However, this is not complete. We still have some flow here as evidenced by the Doppler flow positive. So we now again puncture this varix, find this area and now inject glue again. And this leads to instantaneous formation of this glue cast. And we can see that there is no flow into the varix anymore. And this is the post-procedure CT. This is where we would expect the varix to be. This is the artifact of the coil, and this is the splenic vein over here. And we do not see this varix here. So, with a single coil, we were able to close off a four centimeter varix. Can we go completely no coils? Now, this is this sounds blasphemous because we have always known about coil glue obliteration of uh, varix with EUS, but it can potentially be done if we use undiluted and butyrsalicylate because it solidifies almost instantaneously and we have a large experience of using undiluted and butyl cyanoacrylate in India. Embolization is very rare. Our unit does a lot of gastric variceal obliterations and we have not seen a case of glue-related glue embolization in at least the last 10 years. So we, we can use the anatomy and hemodynamics to our advantage and minimize the risk even further. So let me show with an example of this large varix, which was approximately 74 mm. This is a pretty large varix. We identified the feeder to the whole varix as this short gastric vein. This is the spleen. This is the splenic hilum, and this is the short gastric vein. So we have our needle here in the short gastric vein from the fundus, and here we are injecting glue. So this glue cast has formed here from the short gastric vein, and now that led to partial obliteration. So we now again find this glue cast and use this as a scaffold for another 2 ml of cyanoacrylate glue injection. And this leads to complete obliteration of this feeder. We can see this glue cast blocking off the feeder and the whole varix is now obliterated. 
we can see these speckling changes which are suggestive of formation of thrombus. So even a 74 mm varix could just be tackled by 4 ml of glue. And this is the post-procedure endoscopy a month later. This large varix is now gone and just a small glue cast is what we see coming out. This patient was done a year and a half back and still in our follow-up. So the key here is to identify the feeder. We have to know the anatomy of the vasculature and portal hypertension and know exactly where the collaterals take off from if we want to target them. If there is a CT available, it is definitely helpful to review it. Um, if there is none available, then we can still go ahead, but it definitely helps if we do have one. If we can trace it back to the portal end, it is the feeder because obviously it's a portosystemic collateral. So it has to start from the portal end and go to the systemic end. And then we can use our Dopplers, directional Dopplers, to, to assess where the flow is coming from and be doubly sure. So for example, when we apply the Doppler, we see a lot of aliasing on US. And if once we adjust the scale correctly, we now see proper reds and blues, and we can now know where the direction of blood is coming from in relation to the transducer. And as we move the transducer, this direction changes. And we can use this property to our advantage to make sure that we are dealing with an inflow from, let's say, this end and outflow towards that end. We do not want to inject into the outflow because that can be disastrous. But if we are injecting into the inflow, we are absolutely safe. So we can use this uh, needle to go against the flow. Now, this in this case, the flow is towards the needle. We have XYO models. We have validated what is the uh, speed of flow when we inject glue and it is somewhere between 30 to 50 centimeters per second usually these shunts have a speed of 20 to 30 centimeters per second sometimes 10 centimeters per second so if we are injecting against the flow there is no way that our glue is going to migrate away uh, towards the systemic circulation so we are injecting against the flow with a higher velocity causing Dispersion of the glue, instantaneous solidification in the glue cast forms right here. Let me show this with an example. This is a large varix, approximately 6 centimeters, uh, very high flow. We are going to switch this to a directional Doppler. We are going to change the velocity. To, to high velocity here we can see it's almost 36 that we have kept at the range and now we can see pure reds and blues over here the velocity is approximately 20 centimeters per second and now we are tracing this back to the spleen here we can see the short gastric vein so the short gastric is flowing towards the transducer from here going away from the transducer here so here is where we want to inject this is the first glue cast that is formed this has led to partial obliteration of flow. We still see some flow over here. So we can target this loop once again. Here we are targeting that loop once again. And again, inject this whole, this whole loop is now gone. And we can see that the shunt is completely obliterated and, and the flow is much lower now. This patient had one more feeder, it, one of the 20% cases which have more than one feeders and uh, we obliterated that too and this was the result. We can see before and after, this is a large varix over here, we do not see that here. We can see that there are no coils over here. The whole thing is gone and the large plenary shunt has almost involuted completely. This is a month later. So we have been able to completely take care of this large gastric varix and the shunt associated just with 6 ml of glue. So <coughs> it works well for esophageal viruses, uh, gastric viruses. How about esophageal viruses? Well, for most esophageal viruses, banding does the job. However, sometimes we encounter some weird cases. So we need to know that esophageal viruses are again fed by either the left gastric vein or one of the short gastric veins. And it beyond the palisade zone, it cont continues as esophageal viruses. So this is a very difficult case that we encountered about a couple of years back. This was a patient who had a mid esophageal variceal bleeding. This is approximately 25 centimeters that this large bleeding varix is seen, and there are viruses even lower down. So we could not band it here. We just injected sclerosant and achieved hemostasis. 
and then sent the patient for a CT scan. And here we can see on CT scan this large, large uh, mediastinal varix, which is bleeding at this point. And this is all related to cirrhosis. We can even see vein thrombus here on the scan. This is second here in the portal vein thrombosis, and this is a, a feeder to this whole varix. So uh, we we were out of options here. This patient was quite sick, so we decided to go ahead and block off this shunt. So we injected a couple of coils over here in in the feeder vessel, and then injected glue into the varix right here, the feeder vessel, and we can see the feeder and the glue cast over here. The flow is completely disrupted. And these are the mediastinal collaterals. We can see some air from, from where we have injected. And this is the before and after CT scan. We can see that the portal vein thrombus has automatically recanalized because of improved flow into the portal vein. The whole mediastinal conglomerate is collapsed and we can see the same here. So we can we know that we can tackle bleeding viruses. We, we know that we can completely obliterate the shunts. But can we uh, target complete shunts for recurrent hepatic encephalopathy with BUS? Well, it is possible because most of these shunts arise from this area, the left portal vein forming the paraumbilical, main portal vein, uh, the splenic vein which forms the splenogastrorenal shunts, or occasionally the uh, mesentrico cable shunt. Now, all of these areas are easily accessed with BUS. So let me show you a case where we had a 74 year old man who presented the recurrent hepatic encephalopathy. This patient had a large shunt over here but could not afford a BRTO. We saw that this is where the fundus and the cardia of the stomach is and we can, we can see the shunt over here. So we thought we could access the shunt here with BUS. This is the area where we could access the shunt. This is where the stomach fundus would lie, this area. So we targeted this shunt, placed a coil and injected some glue. This led to partial obliteration of the shunt. We then went in for, uh, again, punctured the area and injected more glue and coil there. So we now had two coils and glue. And this was the result. This shunt has completely obliterated and this patient uh, uh, resolved his hepatic encephalopathy. This was another case where we had a large paraumbilical uh, para vein with a caput medusa. This again we, we could tackle with EUS. We could identify a bend where we could lodge our coil. This was a good bend with float towards the varix over here. So here we would lodge our coil and inject glue. And this led to complete obliteration of the flow. And this was the post-procedure CT showing complete obliteration of the shunt. We can do the same for ectopic viruses, whether they be a stomal, duodenal, or rectal viruses. We can choose to use EUS or we can even tackle them endoscopically. That is uh, a person-to-person -person choice. We do not have much data on that. However, it seems that uh, for gastric viruses, we have strong uh, evidence on the use of EUS. We can use coils with a glue, gel foam, thrombin, or just coils alone. It all works. And over time, we are realizing that we can use glue only, and we'll be presenting our data on Sunday morning on the use of coils with glue versus glue alone, and we feel they are comparable. Uh, identification of feeder definitely makes life easier, and uh, if there is a CT beforehand, we should assess that. And whether US can be used for esophageal viruses and shunts, well, uh, the data is not there yet, but we do have some promising uh, data coming up. So watch this space for more. Thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions, unfortunately, I am not there, but I hope somebody in the hall can take them up. Thank you.